You all must have seen Steven Spielberg's movie Jaws. You saw that the shark has two jaws basically, an upper and a lower jaw. They move together in a snapping position and rips people to shreds. Now, if we talk about humans, we have the similar anatomy, an upper jaw and a lower jaw. The upper jaw is attached to your skull and the lower jaw is freely moving. I'm calling it free moving because in normal nomenclature, it is said to be a part of the skull. However, in reality, it lacks any anatomical connection to the skull. It is joined to the skull at the temporomandibular joint. The lack of fixation allows a variety of movements we require for mastication, which is the chewing process, enabling you to snap and shred your food into pieces like the shark did, which is why it is the strongest and largest bone of the face. It is especially strong in carnivores due to its ferocious nature. Mandible is derived from the Latin word mandir, meaning to chew. It is a fascinating bony structure, not quite a long bone, not a flat bone, but it is somehow U in shape with projections coming out of it. With the upper border containing the little sockets where your teeth fit in called the alveolar processes. Let's do a fun activity which will help you identify the different parts of the mandible. Put your thumb on your chin like this. This is the exact location of the symphysis menti and you're actually feeling the mental protuberances of the body of the mandible till here. Now sliding back, you would feel the angle of the mandible. Further moving upwards and backwards would help you identify the rami. And then on the top, you can feel we have the processes over here. So the mandible has three parts, the body, the rami, and the projections on the top. Let's look at the peculiar features of each in the next sections. Starting with the body of the mandible. This part, as I told you, in the surface anatomy is the body of the mandible. It forms the lower jawline. Let's simplify things for a better memory. Remember the formula of two here, which means two surfaces and two borders. Each half of the body has two surfaces, outer and the inner surfaces and two borders, upper and the lower border. Let's discuss the outer surface first. The outer surface presents different salient features. Going away from your chin, we have the symphysis manti is the line at which the right and the left halves of the bone meet each other. It is marked by a faint ridge. Mentum is basically a terminology used for chin, and the word symphysis over here indicates the fusion of these two bones which were initially separate. Over here, look for the mental protuberance, which is a median triangular projecting area in the lower part of the midline. The inferior lateral angles of the protuberance form the mental tubercles. The mental foramen lies below the interval between the premolar teeth as shown in the figure, which is a hole and makes a secret canal into the inside of the jaw. This oblique line over here is the continuation of the sharp anterior border of the ramus of the mandible. If you observe, it basically is a bony elevation running all the way to the mental foramen. Lastly, focus on the depression located below the incisor teeth. Simply remember it by the terminology of the incisive fossa. Remember I told you the naming in anatomy is always relatable. So is the case here. So to summarize, on the outer surface, we have the projections, the symphysis manti, mental protuberances, 
and the oblique line. And we have two depressions, incisive fossa on the outside and on the inside we have the sublingual fossa, mental foramen and the incisive fossa. Lastly, let's rotate the mandible like this and look closely into the inner surface. Here we have to look for the mylohyoid line starting from the third molar up till the genial tubercles, which are the projections as seen here. If you go just below the mylohyoid line, there is the submandibular fossa accommodating the submandibular gland. And if you go above it, there is a sublingual fossa obviously homing the sublingual gland. Hope you are with me and processing all these features in your mind because these facts should flash up in your mind during your examinations. After you are done with that, focus on these genial tubercles. There are basically just the bony elevations we have. Two superior and two inferior tubercles. If you can actually locate this mylohyoid groove, it's charting on the ramus and sliding onto the body of the tubercle. Now coming to the discussion of the two borders. We have the upper border, which is the alveolar border. This border has sockets for your teeth to fit in. Now if you trace down the lower border or the base, you would definitely notice the ovoid depression which is called the digastric fossa for accommodating the anterior belly of the digastric. So to summarize, remember we have three of everything. Three projections and three fossas on the outer surface. The projections are the symphysis manti, mental protuberances and the oblique lines. On the inside again, we have three bony markings, a mylohyoid line and two genial tubercles. On the posterior aspect, we have three fossas, the sublingual, the submandibular, and the digastric fossa on the lower border. While on the anterior aspect, we have the incisive fossa. One thing that you have to remember is that all of these bony markings are present bilaterally. While doing your makeup, you must have heard the word contouring. It is a trick used to enhance the angle of the mandible, which seems to be a sign of beauty these days. Now this angle is actually between the body and the ramus of the mandible. The ramus is quadrilateral in shape and again to help you remember the rule of two with four borders. Two surfaces, lateral and medial. Two processes, the coronoid and the condyloid processes. Whereas four borders, upper, lower, anterior and the posterior border. Talking about the two surfaces. On the lateral surface, it bears a number of oblique ridges generated by the masseter muscle. It fixes itself among these ridges. The medial surface presents a lot of interesting features. So just looking at the medial surface, imagination helps a lot. So let's consider the mandibular foramen as a secret tunnel which is going to lead into the secret passage, which is the mandibular canal. And finally, we end up coming out of the mantle foramen. The anterior margin of the mandibular foramen is marked by a sharp tongue-shaped projection and thus getting its name lingula, meaning tongue. It's facing upwards and backwards towards the head of the mandible. Here, first of all, locate the mandibular foramen and if you chase it forward and downward, interestingly, it gets lost on the submandibular fossa. Now, here we have the angle of the mandible formed between the ramus and the body of the mandible. Coming to the borders, this is the upper border, the lower border, 
anterior and the posterior borders. The upper border of the ramus is thin and is curved downwards forming the mandibular notch. You might be familiar with this torque wrench which is quite similar to the upper border of the ramus. Here you can see the mandibular notch similar to the one in the wrench. Now focus on to the lower border of the ramus forming the angle of the jaw. If you observe closely, it's thinner anteriorly and thicker posteriorly. The coronoid is a Greek word meaning crow's beak. So interestingly, it even resembles that. So if you focus on this bony projection, it's triangular and flat. Anteriorly, it's smoothly fusing into the anterior border of the ramus and posteriorly, it forms this U-shape that is the mandibular notch. The condyloid is a Latin word meaning knuckle-like. So actually due to its shape, this particular terminology is being used. The condyloid process is a strong upward projection from the posterior superior part of the ramus. So looking from the medial side, Mr. Condyloid has a head and interestingly a constriction below which is called the neck. This mister is the common site of mandibular fractures which may occur due to you falling on your chin. The head is covered with the fibrocartilage and articulates with the temporal bone to form the temporomandibular joint. Remember I told you that here your mandible attaches to the skull and provides the movement while talking or chewing. Its anterior surface presents a depression called the pterygoid fovea where the pterygoid muscle attaches. Talking about the muscle attachments, uh, these are very important to allow the movements of the lower jaw. Let's explore them in detail. Hey students, before diving into further details, I need to finish my smoothie. As you all know that muscles are the key factors that help us perform any function. So which muscle would it be that helped me out suck out through the straw? It's the buccinator. In addition to that, it is responsible for the whistling action. Now observe closely on this diagram for the origin of the buccinator starting from the oblique line to the anterior border of the first molar. In front of this origin, there are two depressors, the depressor anguli oris and the depressor labi inferioris. And from the oblique line below the mental foramen, these are the expressions created by the depressor anguli oris. The name itself is self-explanatory. Oris, the mouth, anguli, the angle, and depressor, a depression meaning it depresses the angle of the mouth. If you look here, the name depressor labi inferioris indicates that it depresses the lower lip. This is the expression that is created. We'll be detailing all these muscles in a separate lecture as it is beyond the focus over here. So stay tuned on scotty.com for that. Remember, I mentioned the incisive fossa. It gives origin to the mentalis and the mental slips of the orbicularis oris. One another important attachment is the mucous membranes of the mouth that are attached to the alveolar margins. So to summarize, on the anterior aspect of the body, we have the attachments of the buccinator, depressor anguli oris, depressor labi inferioris, and orbicularis oris. Have you people noticed that the fossas or tubercles are named after the particular muscle attachments that they have, so making it a lot easier to remember. For instance, the mylohyoid line gives origin to the mylohyoid muscle. Moving on just posterior to it is the attachment of the superior constrictor muscles of the pharynx. If we go behind it, there is an attachment of the pterygo mandibular raphae in continuation. The upper genial tubercles gives origin to the genioglossus 
and the lower tubercles to the geniohyoid as shown in the figure. The digastric fossa lodges the anterior belly of the digastric muscle. In addition to that, the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia gets attached to the base of the mandible. The platysma is inserted into the lower border. The expression below highlights the action of the platysma. This is when you actually tense your neck muscles. The platysma becomes prominent and the expression created is shown here. Remember, on the interior aspect of the body, we have the attachments to the mylohyoid muscle, the superior constrictor muscle, the pterygo mandibular raphae, the digastric muscle, the genioglossus, and lastly, the geniohyoid muscle. We remembered mandible from the movie Jaws, and now we'll remember these muscles through Jaws filmmaker, Mr. Spielberg. He must have paid dollars for achieving these great goals. So the mnemonic here is, Mr. Spielberg paid dollars for great goals. M for mylohyoid, S for the superior constrictor muscle, P for the pterygo mandibular raphae, D for the digastric muscle, and the G for the genioglossus, and the last G for the geniohyoid muscle. That was super easy. Now heading towards our discussion on attachments of the ramus. Let me introduce you to the master of the mastication, which is the masseter, which is involved in the elevation of the mandible and is the chief muscle of mastication. The whole of the lateral surface of the ramus, except the posterior superior part, provides insertion to the masseter muscle. The posterior superior part of the lateral surface is covered by the parotid gland, as you can see over here. The temporalis is inserted into the apex and medial surface of the coronoid process. The insertion extends downwards on the anterior border of the ramus. The lateral pterygoid muscle is inserted into the pterygoid fovea on the anterior aspect of the neck. The muscle is related to the medial surface of the ramus above the mandibular foramen. One muscle is on the medial surface of the ramus, that is the medial pterygoid muscle. It is inserted on the medial surface of the ramus on the roughened area below and behind the mylohyoid groove. It is in contact with the medial surface in front of the groove. To summarize, the ramus gives attachments to the masseter, medial and the lateral pterygoid, and the temporalis muscle. Now the nerves in this close vicinity are shown over here, namely the mental nerve, the mandibular nerve, the masseteric nerve, inferior alveolar nerve, auriculotemporal nerve, and the lingual nerve. So to help you remember the nerves that are related to the mandible, we have a mnemonic, three M's are lovely. This will help you retain the names of the nerves. So the three M's are the mantle nerve, the mandibular, nerve and the mesoteric nerve, A for alveolar and L for the lingual nerve. Lingual nerve may get damaged during extraction of the third molar and may result in the loss of sensations in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Having a sound knowledge regarding the anatomy of the mandible gives us a fair idea on the weak points that can be subjected to trauma. So you would get across patients of road traffic accidents in whom there is a suspicion of the fracture of the mandible. The mandible is commonly fractured at the canine socket where it is weak. Involvement of the inferior alveolar nerve in the callus may cause neuralgic pain, which may be referred to the areas of distribution of the buccal and the auriculotemporal nerves. 
If the nerve is paralyzed, the area supplied by the mental nerve becomes insensitive. The next common fracture of the mandible occurs at the angle. So I hope uh, you have now a good grasp over the anatomical features of the mandible and I hope the mnemonics would help you out in your examinations. Do comment down below if you have any queries regarding the uh, lecture.